All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll do my best to move us along and get us to the panel, which I'm sure everybody is looking forward to. So we already heard uh, people this morning motivate uh, some of the reasons why we try to uh, exploit space. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that the bottom line here is all of us are aware of these things, but none of these services, capabilities, or activities are guaranteed. They're not protected. There's not uh, a space vice going around and, 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 and trying to make sure that uh, everybody's behaving properly, whatever that means. And so that's one of the foundational things that I want to capitalize on this morning. We've heard about this idea of unhindered access to space, protection, orbital safety. Uh, but foundationally, one of the things that really gets to that is the ability to quantify, assess, and predict the behavior of these objects uh, as a function of time and space and understand how these things interact with each other and what the human uh, uh, piece of this is. Uh, some people might wonder why space object behavioral sciences, uh, the behavioral sciences piece in what we're trying to bring to the table is that uh, somebody uh, asked me, Marie, but can you tell me what the intent of that satellite is? And it's like, yeah, that's easy. It has none because it's not a person. Uh, satellites lack intent. And so uh, if you want to understand American culture in space, uh, you'll notice that most maneuvers don't happen on weekends, holidays, Fridays, or Mondays. And that's just the way we do business. And so there's a human element in understanding how things behave uh, on orbit. One of the interesting things, and I, I want to bring back some of the words of Dr. Neild here, is, is this idea of, of Wild West. And so uh, the space frontier is like the, the, the Western frontier of old. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of rules and regulations kind of on orbit. There are guidelines. There are things that people say would be kind of good and, and things that are demonstrably not so good. Um, People are after this bonanza. I can tell you that just a few weeks ago, I was in San Francisco, uh, uh, cordially invited to participate in this uh, Space Technology and Investment Forum by the Space Foundation, thank you very much, uh, and where I was able to interface with venture capitalists who are seeing this kind of line of sight extra exit strategy, uh, angel investors, they want to get, get on orbit. It's dollars for pixels, and they want to capitalize on Earth imagery. And it's not like most of these people realize the, the kind of the perils of operating in space and, 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 and one of the you know, biggest risks uh, to, pre to prevent uh, basically their, their investments on not working as they thought uh, was, was appropriate. Also, I can say that uh, with the cost of getting to space becoming cheaper, the actual risk of operating in space uh, is actually increasing because it's kind of like the transcontinental railroad and what that did for business connecting the East Coast with the West Coast. Now you have a lot of people just putting stuff up there, but again, uh, are they really understanding what it means to be on orbit and is anybody thinking about this in a holistic sense? So tragedy of the commons. Why tragedy of the commons? Not my term. It is a thing. It's not my thing. It, apparently it's William Foster Lloyd's thing from 1833 where he posited that, that when you have lots of users that have this common kind of environment that they're trying to exploit, um, if every user is acting in self-interest alone, then that ends up being to the detriment of the whole. As we drove in here this morning, we looked to the right and we saw a bunch of cattle. So let's use that as an example. Got a nice plot of land. Uh, all of us are cattle herders. I could. I can't really imagine myself doing that, but that's just say for the sake of uh, argument here. We're all cattle herders, and for each head of cattle, we make a profit. But at some point, if we just, again, acting in self-interest, the more heads of cattle I have at some point, we get into overgrazing, and it's to the detriment of the whole. So the thing is, who's monitoring this kind of writ large for space? Who's really, is there an EPA for space? No, there isn't. Just like in the Wild West, when people came out to the West for mining, there was uh, mercury contamination, silt in the water, uh, shanty towns were kind of put together. It's not like they were you know, built to, 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 to last forever, that sort of stuff. It was go, make a quick buck, and then move on. But we can't necessarily afford that sort of mentality for space. So we're at a critical juncture, I think, in having uh, these sorts of uh, discussions to make sure that we move forward smartly. Confirmation bias. That's another thing ailing our community, uh, unfortunately, is that um, we have pockets of people, they've been doing uh, space surveillance and these things for years, they have their own ideas, their own algorithms, and whenever they test out new stuff, 
they always kind of use their stuff as the gold bar, and of course, uh, you know, oh, you, you, you tried your algorithm and it didn't work as well as mine. Well, you know, but uh, mine always works with this data. Well, but how about if you use this one over here? Oh, well, maybe I'm not so interested in that. The thing is, we need to start dispelling this idea of confirmation bias, and we need to be extremely scientific and hold everything to equal scrutiny because we, we need to get the best ideas. We can't afford to just be uh, uh, kind of picking and choosing uh, you know, with any sort of favoritism. One of the interesting things that I saw recently was this idea of uh, collisions in space. And this was somebody from the, from the White House, from OSTP, sent me this thing. And it was a real study where it was modeling collisions in space using kinetic theory of gases, which assumes that everything is governed by this random Brownian motion. And when things collide, they don't create more objects. And I'm like, Really? This is the thing that we're basing decisions? We can't have that stuff anymore. And so there's really an invocation for transparency, openness, diversity, a lot of the things that you heard uh, the previous speakers uh, talk about. So uh, here's this database, this catalog of objects. Stratcom uh, has developed and maintained about 22,000 things, size of a softball and larger. Um, and out of those things, about 1,200 things work. Everything else is trash. You saw uh, General Brown, what she plotted with, you know, from Sputnik all the way on. So there's, so there's bad news, uh, a little bit of bad news with that. We don't fully understand all the sources and sinks into the population, and that's one of the things that we need to get our arms around. So what do I mean by we don't fully understand some things? Well, it turns out there's this really awesome sensor that was developed uh, for the US government, uh, funded by DARPA uh, uh, through MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And it's called the Space Surveillance Telescope. And it's just up the road here, uh, in, uh, close to Socorro. And the good thing about the Space Surveillance Telescope is that it detects lots of stuff. The bad news about the Space Surveillance Telescope is that it detects lots of stuff. Um, and so basically what you see here is you see a plot. There's a lot of dots on the plot. I'm not asking you to really understand all the dots, but the thing that I want you to take away from this is that all the dots, so this is a single night's worth of detections from that telescope. All the dots up there that are black are things that were detected that we know what those things are. Anything up there that's not a black dot are things we have no clue. No clue, we don't know. Which one of those you know, non-black dots could be a threat? Which could be harmful? Which one could have some intent ascribed to it? Which one is just perilously kind of, who knows? We don't know. And the thing is, we detect lots of stuff that we can't track. So detecting stuff and tracking things, not necessarily the same thing. And that's one of the things that we need to reconcile is, why is it that we detect many things that, that are untrackable? Yes, we have a catalog of 22,000 things, but those are the trackable stuff. That's not the detectable stuff. The detectable stuff is who knows how much that is. Everybody has their own kind of idea of what that number is, and guess what? They don't agree so well with each other, and, and so that's not so good. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, why is it that we can't reconcile uh, all these detections coming from unique objects? Why can't we track this stuff, and can we bring to the table some science to help put that problem away? Some of it is the data that we're collecting may not be optimal. Some of it is the algorithms that we're using may not be optimal. We don't necessarily share all the sensor data together. So there are a series of things that could potentially be large obstacles in being able to understand this stuff. I can tell you, for one, um, the way we model things, uh, we could make some improvements there. Turns out that the way we kind of the state of practice of, of modeling of all these things is like spheres. Everything's a cannonball in space. Now, there's a reason why uh, that started that way. Uh, part of it was computational things. Part of it's because it makes the math easier. There, there's a, and, 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 and by the way, it's not a horrible assumption in the, in the sense that by modeling everything as a sphere, guess what? We apparently track about 22,000 things. So the thing is, it works. But does it work for everything? No. And so the thing is, if we want to start moving towards really being able to manage this idea of space traffic and orbital safety and that sort of stuff, we need to start progressing the science and the knowledge such that we can start modeling things to look more like they actually do versus just the cannonball model. And, and that's not uh, any poke at the DOD whatsoever, because in fact, they have JMS and a bunch of other programs where we're actually evaluating how to move forward on this. But that's just kind of putting this out to the community that, hey, we still have a ways to go, and, and we need to work together to kind of make this happen. So along with that, 
Yeah, where are the constituents of that space object po uh, population? Uh, guess what? Not everything behaves the same way. One of the things that we'd love to be able to do is create a taxonomy for man-made objects, much like we have a taxonomy for living organisms, where we can say, here, things made out of multi-layer insulation that are in LEO, this is how they behave. These are the data that you should collect to understand these things, and we can predict how these things interact. Oh, by the way, MLI, not in LEO, but in GEO, behaves differently because the habitat is different and the way it interacts with the environment is different. And that way, with very few observations, instead of trying to track everything all the time, you can be more surgical and say, guess what, a rocket body. Uh, we understand that. Uh, if we want to understand the idea of track custody, how to keep custody of objects. Custody of aircraft means, hey, you want to you wanna have, you wanna know where that thing is all the time because Guess what? The behavior of aircraft can be very different from one moment to the next. You could be steady flight, 40,000 feet. All of a sudden, bad things happen in a relatively short amount of time. For things on orbit, guess what? There's this thing called gravity. It happens to be dominating motion. Um, large, kind of dead rocket bodies near geo, if I see it now, it sounds good. If I see it two minutes later, it's not going to make a huge left turn. It's not going to be someplace completely different. So I don't need to observe that all the time. But maybe a low thrusting kind of satellite, which is highly maneuverable, maybe I need to observe that more frequently. So can we have a taxonomy for the man-made space object population? Can we ascribe to that taxonomy requirements for what custody means in terms of knowing how that thing is going to behave that could substantiate this effort of really trying to understand uh, orbital safety and space traffic? And oh, by the way, uh, when we try to develop these rules of the road and the, these policies, how can we assess how well these policies are actually working, are they meeting their intent, uh, are they useful, and that sort of thing. So, uh, kind of our own ideas of, of what uh, some of the government's role is in, in this whole thing. For one, in the sense of retiring risk, um, again, people that see, it, see space as this big bonanza and just want to get in and get out and get some, lots of money, uh, they're not necessarily understanding all the risks of operating in space, and so we need to make sure that, that people can do so responsibly and safely. Um, certainly from a research perspective, there are things that doesn't make sense for private industry to try to do because, well, it's too risky. Uh, places like the Air Force Research Lab and other government uh, laboratories, their, their whole thing should be retiring that risk to the point where technology can be matured, handed off to uh, commercial industry, and then have people make lots of money based on that. But there's a risk retirement activity that needs to be done. Uh, also, this idea of regulating and enabling. So glad to hear uh, Dr. Neil talk about this. That's, that's exactly right. Um, people have said, well, what do you think about if the industry just self-regulates altogether? I can tell you right now that there are people on orbit um, that have a vested interest in not having other people share their same orbital altitude. And companies that have come to me and said, hey, you know, I want to be up there. But for some reason, this company keeps on saying, oh, if there's one more satellite here, it's too risky and it's going to cause big trouble. That's like, you know, Back to what Dr. Neil talked about. He talked about traffic on freeways and that sort of stuff, and kind of the things that you would need to have in place if you wanted to go and have, I don't know, let's call it an afternoon margarita after uh, all this is said and done, right? Um, but the thing is, is that we, can, we should not be afraid of congestion. We should not be afraid of traffic. We should be afraid of being stupid and ignorant. That's what we should fear. And so we should do whatever we can to eliminate that ignorance, be smart about what's going on up there, understand it, monitor it, kind of get a good feel for it, and then kind of pass the right regulations and do so in a way that enables commerce and doesn't prevent other people from getting up there because you got somebody that's making lots of money that doesn't want somebody else to compete with them. And then that idea of assessing and enforcing. Who's going to monitor this stuff? Who's going to put the checks and, and know when somebody's doing something that they might not uh, uh, be allowed to do or, or, or that sort of thing? So we want to put in place sufficient quantities of data and enough people uh, that can share in that common data pool to, uh, to be able to assess those things. Um, one of the things that uh, we, you know, I think is very important is, again, this idea of a common data pool. I think if the FAA does kind of take this over uh, long term, uh, it should have access to m many, many, many sources of data, uh, and, and they can share that with other government agencies. And you know, the thing that really makes sense is that from a common data pool, many questions can be asked. And the, the, the products that come from that, uh, those questions, those should be relevant to the specific missions and needs uh, of that agency or of uh, those entities. And so just kind of talking more about that, um, this is an example. Uh, so we have the STRATCOM catalog. And let's say, for instance, we have this common data pool. And, and from that common data pool, let's say that 
you know, the FAA in terms of space traffic management can ask questions about that. Um, basically, based on those questions, the products that the FAA would get for space traffic management aren't necessarily gonna look one-to-one -one with what the current catalog looks like. It might have a different shape, form, certainly different function, but the key thing is to have statistical consistency. And statistical consistency is something that should be cherished, it's, it's something that should be pursued because that actually helps find mistakes. From personal experience, I can tell you that when I worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, working with the European Space Agency on Mars Express, we had a common data pool, but we had our own tools. And the cool thing is that we could compare orbits with each other, and guess what? The orbits of Mars Express were never the same. Why? Because we had different assumptions. We had different models, but we had a common data pool. However, the orbits were statistically consistent with each other. And whenever there wasn't a, a statistical consistency, huh, why are they statistically inconsistent? Oh, because I made, I didn't take this into account. Now, all of a sudden, you start seeing statistical consistency. Things make sense. When I was part of the Air Force Research Lab, tracking lots of debris, uh, there was one occasion when there's a sp specific piece of debris and, and a sub-geo drifting about uh, four degrees eastward per day. I had three sensors, and I processed the data. My predictions weren't so good. I couldn't understand why, and I started having kind of a separate, let's call it a separate database or catalog based on each sensor and the combination of sensors. And whenever sense, whatever solutions had sensor A in it seemed to be statistically inconsistent with everything else. So finally I went to the people who were collecting the data and I said, sensor A, whenever I process data with sensor A, something is not right. And they said, ah, oh, Mariba, we're sorry. When we looked at the raw images, instead of telling you where the satellite was in the image, there was a hot pixel, just a white, bright pixel, and that's what we were reporting. Oh, once they fixed that, statistical consistency. So everybody having their own kind of database to serve their needs isn't something that should be feared. It could be embraced, but the foundational thing is that statistical consistency is what we should be driving towards. So I'm in, in the interest of time, because I really want to get to the, the panel, uh, I'll just say University of Arizona is here to help. Uh, academia in general is about scientific uh, rigor and inquiry. Uh, one of the people from OSTP uh, asked me, hey, Mariba, do you think that you could be like Lady Justice, put the blindfolds on, and whoever brings you any sort of algorithm or any idea, could you just evaluate it with equal rigor and scrutiny no matter where it comes from? The answer is yes, and academia is a good uh, place to, to do that. Certainly, uh, unconstrained from art of the state of practice, but looking at art of the possible, that's something that we can easily do. We can engage with international countries in a way that government to government may be uh, not, so, not so easy to do. And certainly the idea of workforce development. I can tell you that many people have come to us saying, hey, you know, we have one web, we have 800 satellites or whatever we want to put there. How do, who's going to operate this stuff? Who's going to manage this stuff? Where do we train these folks? So we have a Master's of Engineering in SSA uh, this time next year, and we're looking at training and certificate programs. But again, this is something that academia can do writ large, and so I'm just going to go over this because, uh, oh, by the way, my kids are into Harry Potter, so I said, hey, we want to have something like the Hogwarts of, 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 of SSA and space traffic management in the sense that you can get, be, be an astronomer, you can go to the, the, the law school and get a law degree, you can do government public policy, you can do physics, but everybody takes the dark arts class. So everybody knows, uh, everybody knows the pain of each other, right? The, the, the policy person has, knows what a telescope looks like and, and knows how difficult it is to track something. The person tracking stuff knows that it's not easy to reach consensus and, and pass policy and that sort of stuff. That way everybody kind of goes out into the workforce and, and there's a, a sensible idea of the pains that everybody goes through so that we can actually uh, make progress uh, as a community writ large. So I, just, I know that was kind of, but there you go. All right.